Fine. <laughs> Hello, everyone. On behalf of Syroid Global, I, Pia Mukherjee, would like to welcome you all to the focused webinar, How to Feed the World, Tales from Leading Indian Plant Scientist. For those of you joining Syroy even for the first time today, Syroy was launched in 2015, and it's a program of WinStep Forward, which is a nonprofit volunteer-driven organization that promotes science exchange between India and United States. To that end, we host annual events, subject-specific webinar, just like the one today, career fair, and recruitment drive throughout the year. So today, the topic we are focusing on is close to all our heart who are present here because we are aware that about 9 million people dies globally every year from starvation alone. So as plant scientists and students, it's our responsibility to do something about it. So let's learn today from our eminent speakers how we can contribute to alleviate some of these issues and what opportunities India holds for us. Let's welcome Dr. Anik Loop Thanaraj, Dr. Ravi Maruta Chalam, Dr. Jyoti Lakshmi Vadaseri, and Dr. Rao, I don't know if he is here yet, um, experts from various domain of the plant world. So before we get into the introduction of our first speaker, uh, Anana, if you could share the uh, slide for the rules. So I would encourage all our audience to keep yourself muted unless you are speaking. And uh, if, if you want to uh, ask our speakers question, please hold on to that until the end of all the talks and raise your hand, turn on your video because it will have more interactive uh, session that way. So uh, with that, I would like to introduce our first speaker, Dr. Anik Lukdhanaraj, who is a science fellow from Bayer or Bayer Crop Science, uh, depending on which part of the globe the pronunciation varies a little bit. Dr. Dhanaraj serves as a competitor analyst in the organization. By training, he is a plant molecular biologist and has worked on plant tissue culture, molecular markers, and other molecular platforms. Dr. Dhanaraj received his undergrad and graduate degrees from University of Agricultural Sciences from Bangalore, India. Soon after his PhD, he moved to United States for his postdoctoral study at USDA Bellsville. He has over 15 years of experience in supporting the launch of BT cotton in India. Apart from science, Dr. Dhanaraj is passionate about science outreach program as well and have established many such activities in the Bangalore site. Today, we will hear about his academic journey, his contribution to industrial research, and some tips that will help us in finding an industry job in India. So Dr. Dhanaraj, the floor is all yours now. Yeah. Thank you so much, Tia, for the kind words. And I should say it's an honor and a pleasure to interact and talk with you all and share some of the knowledge that I've kind of gained over the years. So I'll go ahead and share my screen. Yep. So you all can see my slides, right? Yes, yes. Yeah, okay. So what I thought I'll do is talk a little bit about why I'm here in the organization and also give you all an opportunity or, or give you all uh, some information about what it takes if you want to join a company like Bayer and try and focus on opportunities that are available in India and maybe also elsewhere in the world and just let you know what happens here so you all can also kind of think about it and better understand what happens here and what it needs to take to join an organization like Bayer. Okay, so I'll start off with my story. I know Thea, uh, Thea already mentioned some some of my, I mean, whatever I've done, I've studied and things like that, but I thought I'll, to set the stage, I'll just share with you my story of what I'm doing here, why I got here and how I got here. So my name is Anik Tanaraj and I'm also a science fellow in the organization. So, and the person is given the tag of a science fellows when they have contributed a significant amount of scientific knowledge to the organization and also involved in a lot of outreach and other activities. So that's how I was inducted into this program about four or five years ago. Currently, even though I started my career as a molecular biologist in the organization, ran a lot of analyzers and tissue cultures, I don't do that anymore. I'm uh, 
intelligence analyst. So if you all want to know about that, you can ask me what an intelligence analyst does and why I got here and what made me do this. Okay, and I'm working for Bayer or Baya, as she mentioned. So why I'm here. So I'm sure many of you all would have been born in cities in India where sites like this are not uncommon, right? I was born and brought up in Bangalore, lived here pretty much my whole life, other than the little stint that I had going abroad and little work outside. But And scenes like this were not uncommon in Bangalore, as in many um, Indian cities. And growing up, I always had this desire. My heart used to go out whenever I see scenes like this way on the road. And right from when I was a child, I thought that whatever I end up doing in my life, I should be able to see I can produce more for people like this in need, especially children, because my heart always went out for kids. Growing up, I also discovered over the years that I had a deep passion for research. I mean, I never knew it was called research. Then as a child, I used to like taking a white color flower, putting it into a bottle of ink and see it turn blue color over, over a couple of days. And then once we got to understand microscope, learn and look, look at things under the microscope and so on and so forth. So as I kind of grew in my schooling years, I got this desire for research and kind of wanted to take up a career in this. And that's when I discovered that if I do a degree in agriculture, it kind of can bring together these desires that I have, where I can kind of take up a career or pursue research that is a passion that I had. And this passion can also be used to, to see how it could be develop crops that can produce more that could be available to people like this way who need some. So that's how I kind of decided to take up a, de a degree in agriculture. I actually, it's horticulture, specialized in my bachelor's, master's, PhD. And then after that, decided to go to the United States to do a postdoc. So why I decided to go to the US is for more opportunities, for more exposure, for better understanding of technologies, to see how any newest technologies that are being used there could be used elsewhere in the world. And I also had an open mind saying that I may like to take up a job there and live there. And uh, so that with that intention, I went to the United States, did a postdoc there. And once I finished about three and a half years of the postdoc, I decided it's time to move into industry. And uh, I was looking around for opportunities. And at that time, Monsanto, I'm not sure if you're familiar, but Monsanto was a company that was bought over by Bayer in Bayer 2018. So Monsanto had opportunities in Bangalore and mostly through my network and through contacts, I knew about these roles. They may not have been, been advertised. And then I kind of had to see what are the real skills that were needed in these jobs. And all the molecular skills that they had asked for, I had, but uh, I needed to develop on or at least project my soft skills that kind of they didn't know about. I did that and got the job. And then I decided to move back to India. And I started leading a lab supporting the launch of biotech trades in India that Monsanto had brought into. So, and then once I started working for the organization, I realized that with the Bayer acquisition also, the vision that the company has, health for all, hunger for none, is in perfect alignment with my vision. So it kind of is a win-win for both. So I have this desire where whatever I need to do or whatever I want to do in my life should serve a good cause. And working for an organization over here would kind of give me that opportunity where I can use some of the latest technologies and uh, scientific knowledge that is available to see how we can drive towards producing more or developing crops or developing products that will enable crops to produce more, which could be available to people around the world who actually are deprived of it. So that's how I ended up joining a company like Bayer and I continue to work for Bayer. So a little bit about what Bayer does. So I know this talk is uh, focused mostly on plant sciences, but to give you an idea that Bayer actually has three, <clears throat> three business verticals. The crop science part, that's the part that I represent, the pharmaceutical and consumer health. So the pharmaceutical makes various prescriptive medicines and all these are global. We also have facilities in all over the world in Europe, in the United States, and also in India in different proportions. I mean, they may not be as big as everywhere, but we do have developmental, I mean, R&D sites and also other facilities across the globe. So crop science, as you all know, is the agriculture wing of it, where we work towards developing crops to produce more or crop products and things like that way. Pharmaceuticals is medicines and consumer health is over-the-counter medicine. And why I'd like to talk about this is many a times there are many people in the organization who have actually started off their careers in crop science but then over the years have moved to other verticals because you gain knowledge and skills and you see that that knowledge and skill could also be used in pharmaceuticals or consumer health. So just to give you an idea of what happens here and where you could move over your 
journey within an, within an organization like Bayer. Okay, and a little background about Bayer. So the, the organization has more than 1 lakh employees, 100,000 employees. And uh, this is a little data style. I think it's about three years old, but uh, sales was about 4.3 billion. I mean, sorry, 43.5 billion. And how much money we put back into research is quite a bit. I mean, see, we put, put back about 5 billion uh, euros that we get every year back into R&D, showing you all the importance that the company gives towards developing new things, identifying new ways of making better solutions for farmers around the world and so on. And we work out of 87 countries. And this, I'm sure all of you are very, very, very familiar with, so I'll just breeze through it. So you all know the problem that we all are going to be seeing soon, right? We're going to have a lot of people on this earth to feed. We have a lot more food to produce for these people, but our land is not increasing, right? And the way we are eating our food also is increasing, is changing. Many people are looking at animals for protein sources. So this means we have, we also need to have more animals, but to feed the people, but we'll also have less land. And all these because of the environmental conditions, the less availability of land and so on. So how are we going to be able to produce more from less? Okay, so in Bayer, what we do is we work out of five different <clears throat> business uh, research platforms that I'll be talking about. Also give you all an idea of what are the different kind of uh, skill sets that would need if you'll require jobs in any of these uh, in, in any of these research platforms. So first is the breeding. So all of you will know what breeding is. I'm not going to go into a little bit of details, but basically when we look towards improving crop bead breeding or biotechnology or even different ways of breeding, it could be compared to a Google map. So what is Google Maps? Basically it tells us like how we want to get to from point A to point B, right? We say, okay, I'm over here. I want to get here. And it gives us different ways to get there. It could give us the shortest route, the route avoiding tolls, the route avoiding traffic and so on. The same way when we choose a method to improve crops, it could be traditional breeding, molecular breeding, using um, uh, GMOs or gene editing. All these technologies have their own benefits. Some could have benefits over the other. It could be saving time, it could be quicker and so on. And it's up to us to choose which method we want. And this doesn't make any one better than the other because some ways traditional breeding is best, some ways breeding uh, molecular markers help and so on. So it is up to us, we choose which way we want to go depending on our resources available. And like many organizations, we use a lot of traditional breeding in Bayer where we look at the phenotype and decide on what crosses to make and collect that data and, and use them. We also, you all know the advantage of molecular markers. So we have very strong, SNP platforms where we use it for our genotyping. And as you all know, the advantage of genotyping is when the plants are in seedling stage itself, we take a little bit of leaf bit, identify if it has the markers that we want, the SNP markers, and take them for. So we even have these facilities globally. We have very strong, uh, very big labs in the US and also in Singapore and in India. Okay. And uh, over the years, I think about like about 10, 15 years ago, scientists within the organization, at that time it was Monsanto, were looking, yes, uh, genotyping is better than breeding. It saves time, saves resources, it's quicker. Is there any way we can kind of speed this up? That's when the people, by collaborating with others in the organization, especially like engineers, came up with a seed chipper. I'm not sure if you'll have heard of a seed chipper, but many people usually would know about it. So I just spent a couple of minutes talking to you all about this machine that has been developed by the company. So what a seed chipper does is basically, you can even go to YouTube, just Google a seed chipper and you'll have a neat video that comes up. If you had time, I would have shown you all that video myself, but you can go and see it. So the machine actually is a robotic machine that can pick up individual seeds. We extensively use it in corn, quite a bit in soy and in various other crops. It'll pick up a seed, chip off a little portion of the endosperm and that DNA is enough to do your PCR analysis. And we've actually used uh, technology from Douglas. So we have high throughput DNA uh, systems for our PCR using um, water baths and we have we do our PCR on tapes developing millions of data points. So the seed chipping has accelerated the development of our, of our hybrids or varieties in our breeding programs. Okay, and uh, then moving on to the other technology. So you'll see the advantage of a chip of uh, the chip seeds where we, we don't need to actually go and I mean, we do the analysis on individual seeds in the breeding program. And only if the seed has the markers that we're interested in, we go, go ahead and plant them. Okay, so you see the advantage of how we gradually have increased our thing in using different technologies to in aid us in breeding. Then coming to biotech. So I'm sure all of you all are familiar with the different ways in which GMOs are created. So I'll just talk a little bit about the GMO 
that Bayer has produced for Monsanto at that time in India. So I was in, involved in the launch of this product where we actually developed, I mean, we didn't develop, we actually used the BT cotton that was developed in other parts of the world. We we introgressed that gene into various cotton seed companies, hybrids in India and sold it. But before it could be commercialized, we had to do a lot of molecular testing. That's when the labs in Bangalore came in, where we had to do ELISAs to test the content of these proteins and also do insect assays to see the efficacy, whether it's really killing the insect. And we did a whole lot of DNA-based testing assays to see if we have the right event. I'm not sure if you all are familiar with what an event is. So in India, when a GMO is approved, the, it's actually the event that is approved. So you may have the same gene in the US doing well, but if you bring it here, it may not do so well in India because the location of the loci where it integrates is not the best. So in India, it's event approval. So we had to test all the hybrids that our technology partners had these genes integrate into to prove that it's the right event before they can commercialize it. So that's a, the, these are the activities that we used to base out here in Bangalore, all these molecular tests. And I'm sure all of you all know the impact this technology has. It's changed the lives of millions of farmers here in India. Farmers who were once not able to barely make ends meet, were had made enough money to build houses and educate their children and in, increase the livelihood of farmers over the years. So you see this slide just shows you like from when the GMO was launched, how it just in, exponentially increased the production of cotton and um, making India one of the world's biggest exporter on cotton. Okay, and now the latest what we are talking about is GMOs, the company makes GMOs in India, even though the government has not given us approval to commercialize any other GMOs like uh, other traits of cotton or corn, we are still in the approval as uh, requesting RGM to give us, uh, up, I mean, give us approval to commercialize. The other te technologies that we are, we as an organization also use is CRISPR. We are also now using uh, uh, gene editing to see if we can develop products of interest. And one product, our first product is going to be short corn. So what basically short corn is how we are seeing how we can use, how we've used CRISPR to make the plants shorter. And then again, to make, why we want to make corn shorter so that they don't break off with wind. And also kind of instead of the plant using its resources to grow tall, those resources could be diverted towards the kernels to make them produce more. And uh, the company is using biotech breeding and gene editing to develop short corn. And I think the biotech trait is ready it will be launched soon or oh, is in phase three the breeding trait is ready i'm sorry the biotech will be launched soon gene editing we are saying it'll take another four or five years okay so moving over to we finish breeding we finish biotechnology now is crop protection so we also have a crop protection business where we have various parts of the organization working on different kind of chemicals or chemical comp compounds or formulations to control pests diseases or it could be uh, fungicides and also enha enhance seed growth and so on and so forth. Right from identifying molecules, seeing what, how they could be used and uh, all those kind of studies also goes on in the organization. And then again, we also have manufacturing plants all over the world, including in India, where we develop and some of these products for different markets. And uh, we also have our business in biologicals. So we even have people working with microbial expertise also. And basically what we do over here is identifying microorganisms, identify any microorganisms that could help us enhance the value of our products by making better seed coating and so forth. We also do a lot of partnerships, partnering with other companies that have these skills and how we can bring them in towards developing better products for farmers around the world, depending on the geography. So in India, our focus could be different because the environmental conditions are different. The needs are different for the farmers over here who are smallholder farmers than in the West. Okay, so this, this applies for all the research technologies that we are doing. And so with, with these technologies, basically, what are we doing? We're trying to increase the genetics or within the seed, the methods of making the plants better within the seed by giving it better genetics, and also giving solutions that the farmers can apply externally be to control pest diseases and so on. And uh, on the whole, increasing the uh, value of the products for farmers. And the last research focus is data. We also spend quite a bit of uh, focus on data science and seeing how data science can be used to revolutionize agriculture. It could be either in producing better seeds by using predictive breeding. We do quite a bit of that. So instead of doing 100 crosses or thousands of crosses, we have predictive scripts or tools that could be used to speed up breeding or identify superior parent lines in breeding programs. We also have information from various environmental conditions. So we can also 
when we sell seeds, kind of give us a prescription and tell farmers, okay, the likelihood of it going to be raining is so much in this day. So if you take up sowing today or don't spray or pesticide or so on. And in the in places like in the West where the land holdings are huge, we have a lot of information from the farmers in their hardware on the type of the soil and so on and so forth, which we, we can use that information with the farmers to do predictive, ana predictive analysis for them using our sensors and so on and giving them prescriptive uh, options to grow their crops when they buy their seeds. Okay, so then to sum up the various five platforms that we work out of, breeding, biotech, chemistry, biologicals, and data science. And one, I just like to take a moment saying, so people like me were, because of my expertise in biotech, was hired to do work in biotech. But then over the years, being in an organization, you always have to be agile and show that you're learning new things. And how the various tools that I've learned could also help in breeding or biologicals where where it or, or other areas so basically it is not only you come in with a set of skills you also have to show on how you can keep always learning new skills and how they could be applied in various platforms to produce uh, to provide solutions for farmers across the globe something for students that usually students like that what bear does for students we have a thing called a youth ag summit where young people like you all can apply for these have these wonderful ideas and apply for grants and they have a whole set of whole year of working with mentors and getting knowledge from the organization. And then you can throw a pitch. And if it gets, you'll get fund. And if you win, you get funded. We also have various scholarships, okay, for agriculture and biotechnology. If you log on to our website, you can go about and see it. We also have partnerships. What we mean by partnerships is something like the Youth I Summit, but more about if you have a if have you have a startup and you have a wonderful idea. And we may think that idea could be all useful to we us as an organization so we could partner with you all we may have the germplasm you may have the tools so we can see we bring them both together we can provide some solutions for the world okay so that's also something else we do and many of these are like there's a thing currently that is open called uh, grants for ag i think that's what the program is called where young scientists can write for partnerships or awards and this is the last youth ag summit that happened in person in brazil where they actually a lot of people write essays and only about 100 get selected, I think. And this has happened in Brazil. Last year, it was all virtual because of the pandemic. And these are just the delegates. They are called delegates, the students who win them from India. And we spent time mentoring them a whole year and helping them understand what goes on in an industry and so on and so forth. Okay. So with that, I'll wind up. If you all have any questions on the industry, I'll be happy to take it in the end. Okay. So I think I overshot a little bit, but... yeah. Thank you, you Anik. Yeah. It was yeah. it was a wonderful, wonderful talk. I already had so many questions, but I will just hold back yes, until sure, the sure. end. Yeah. yeah. So we will with this, we will move on to our uh, next speaker. So just a reminder to all our audience, um, if you have question, please post them in the chat or wait. Uh, you can also communicate directly. Um, by turning on your video and asking questions to our speakers at the end of all the talks. So uh, with this, I would introduce uh, Dr. Ravi Maruta Chalam, who is an assistant professor at School of Biology, Indian Institute of Science, Education and Research, Tiruvanan Thapuram. His in research interests are to understand the genetic and molecular basis of uniparental genome elimination in plants and to develop genetic tools for improved plant breeding. Dr. Maruta Chalam did his PhD from CSIR Center for Cellular and Molecular Biology in Hyderabad, primarily working on plant reproductive biology. After graduation, he did his postdoctoral studies at the Department of Plant Biology, the University of California, Davis. Let's hear about his academic journey, his contribution to Indian plant science, and some tips that he can share with us about academic position in India. Uh, Dr. Maruta Chalam, please take over. Yeah, thank you. Uh... So can you see my slide? Yes, yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, so thank you, uh, Tia, for the int nice introduction. And also, I would like to thank Shanu for the invitation. So my uh, academic journey, so I was uh, born in Coimbatore uh, in Tamil Nadu. 
and then i did my bachelor's and masters in agriculture uh, from tamil nadu agriculture university coimbatore and then after my uh, masters i moved on to uh, hyderabad uh, center for cellular and molecular biology for my phd so uh, in my phd i worked with imran and then um, in the imran's lab so i would like to um, mention that my entire research career starting from my phd till my postdoc it revolves around ploidy manipulations so as i've shown in the first uh, a slide so the, the my model organism is arabidopsis but it doesn't have any commercial value but it is the most well studied plant and uh, so to begin with arabidopsis as uh, is a predominantly it's a diploid uh, and there are rare tetraploids do exist so in my phd so i increase the ploid from diploid to triploid by identifying a a gene that causes unreduced female gametes and thereby upon fertilization with a male gamete it will produce a triploid so uh, i'm not if time permits i will briefly touch upon what is the importance of this triploid it has some bearing on engineering apomixis and uh, in my post talk so from uh, i scaled down the ploidy of diploid from uh, to haploid uh, so so let us see how this uh, ploidy manipulations uh, fit to the current theme of the talk so if uh, like the world research institute uh, like uh, lists a five course menu to create a sustainable food future by 2050 so each of the five course menu as listed in here has sub menus so what i am going to focus on today is the second uh, menu that is increase food production without expanding agricultural land and in this menu the sub menu is that uh, like uh, improving tools for uh, accelerated plant breeding so uh, so here come so like how we can exploit plant genes for improved plant breeding so here come i will uh, briefly mention the importance of uh, our discovery that is the haploids so as uh, the so what is the importance of haploids in plant breeding so uh, like uh, double haploids so they uh, facilitate rapid development of homozygous inbred lines for example if you want to make a hybrid so the 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 traditional method is to cross two desired parents and generate an f1 so the f1 is 50% uh, like homozygous for all the uh, uh, gene loss right and then uh, the f1 we have to take it through repeated inbreeding or uh, selfing till uh, one achieves the desired level of homozygosity so shown in the diagram uh, above is that uh, uh, in f8 generation okay so you have achieved around 99.6 homo uh, 99.6% homozygosity and again even if you take the generation forward till f50 or f100 you will never ever reach 100% homozygosity because there will be some residual loci that will be segregating in a heterozygous condition so this is the conventional method to generate inbred lines and which is time consuming and this method it's called uh, uh, like you might have heard about uh, the acronym rils which stands for recombinant inbred lines so this is by traditional um, uh, breeding methods on the other hand if you generate a haploid so uh the haploids because it doesn't have a pairing partner so it is homozygous 100% homozygous for all the loci but haploids per se they cannot be exploited for plant breeding because they will be sterile uh, why because since in the absence of pairing partner they will uh, undergo a, a chaotic meiotic segregation and it will give rise to an unbalanced uh, unviable gametes so the haploids has to be doubled to form a, 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 a double haploid so when you double the haploid so you will get 100% homozygosity for all the genetic loci within one or two generations so thereby it facilitates rapid development of inbred lines which can be directly released as cultivar or it can be used as a parents for hybrid uh, breeding so this is the importance of haploids in plant breeding and thus generating haploids in um, Uh, plants it's a multi million or billion dollar business so uh, the commercial importance of haploids can be appreciated from the fact that uh, um uh, sorry Uh, can be appreciated from the fact that a uh, uh, separate book chapter called patents and haploid plants has been dedicated in this uh, book entitled advances in haploid production in higher plants so this discusses about 
uh, uh, like huge number of patents that has been uh, filed and granted for generating haploids in uh, various crop species. So how the haploids are produced? So the haploids are produced uh, so far in majority of the crop species by um, in vitro method, namely a majority uh, by using anther or microspore culture, and then um, uh, like very less um, uh, using uh, uh, like ovary or ovule culture. So this method of anther or microspore culture is pioneered by Guhan Maheshwari from University of uh, Delhi. And since the, their discovery, it, this method has been standardized over uh, like several crop uh, species. But the, uh, the disadvantages of this method is that there is no uniform protocol and uh, this protocol is completely dependent upon the species and genotype and it required technical expertise in terms of tissue culture. The other least exploited method is the implant or the in vivo methods. So here there are uh, 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 like uh, several uh, in vivo methods such as parthenogenesis, semigamy, and then certain haploid inducing genes have been identified in several crop species. And, uh, uh, and the last one which we are interested in is the selective um, triggering selective uh, elimination of one of the parental chromosome after successful fertilization and this has been reported in uh, mostly in distant crosses so the limitation of this in vivo method is that it is limited to few species especially grasses and this molecular basis is not known. So as I mentioned earlier, so this um, uniparental genome elimination uh, triggering uh, haploids has been known since beginning of 19th uh, century. And this has been reported by plant breeders when they attempt to do a distant hybridization wherein they cross two different species to produce an interspecies or intergeneric hybrid. The genetic consequences is that either you result in, uh, if the, both the genomes exist in harmony, you end up in producing an interspecies hybrid. If not, then one of the parental genome is selectively kicked off, thereby producing a uniparental haploid progeny. So this has been reported in several hundred uh, interest uh, distance crosses, mostly in the plants belonging to the Poiaceae and Solanaceae family. Unfortunately, the attempts to understand the molecular basis um, uh, was uh, met with uh, um, uh, uh, failure. Okay, so here come, uh, like um, when I started my postdoc, so I was interested in understanding the basic biology behind how a centromere is specified. So as you know, the centromeres are chromosomal loci that is responsible for the proper segregation of chromosomes during cell division. And research from several model systems have shown that the centromere is in fact epigenetically determined by the localization of a, a, um, a protein called CNH3. So what CNH3 does is that it selectively replaces the histone H3 from the nucleosomes of the chromatin uh, with the, a centromere specific version called CNH3. So basically, so wherever the CNH3 protein is targeted, that region will be specified as the centromere. So, to, uh, so uh, given the importance of the CNH3, uh, mutation in CNH3 causes embryo lethality and using this embryo lethal mutant, so to understand the structure function relationship, so we generated a series of point mutations in CNH3 and also we cloned CNH3 from several um, crop species. And then using the null mutant, we try to complement and then see the uh, study the genetics. So during this course, what we discovered is that, so even like when we, uh, when we have a wild type plant, okay, which contains the normal CNH3, when you cross uh, that plant with a, a um, uh, with a plant that is expressing either a mutants in H3 and this mutant can be any of the point mutation listed here. And there are several point mutations, which I have not listed that also triggers um, uniparental genome elimination. And also if you uh, uh, express an orthologous in H3 in the CNH3 null mutant background and then cross that plant to a wild type in H3 parent. So you can trigger uh, uniparental genome elimination mimicking the consequences of uh, distant crosses in a intraspecific cross. So the take home message is that you have a plant that, um, that contains normals in H3 and if you uh, cross it to a, a plant, an isogenic parent or plant that contains a modified in H3, then you can trigger uniparental genome elimination to produce haploids. So, uh, so, uh, so uh, what we propose is that the genome elimination is a promising approach for haploid induction in recalcitrant crop species. Why? Because NH3 is universally present in all plants, and this is the major epigenetic determinant of the centromeres. And the strategy is that um, we have to isolate the NH3 null mutant, which can be uh, done either using tilling or 
gene silencing or by using uh, targeted gene editing. And you have to complement the SNH3 null with altered SNH3 variant. And this altered SNH3 can be a si simple point mutation in SNH3, or you can express an uh, orthologous SNH3 from a different plant species. So that will also serve the purpose. Then you have to cross the um, mutants in H3 expressing plant with a wild types in H3 expressing plant, then you can produce haploids um, uh, from any genotype of interest. Okay, so how, what you can do with this haploid inducer that we have generated. So we can practice something called analytical breeding. Why? Because you know that majority of the cultivated uh, plants are polyploid. So during doing genetics in uh, polyploids is very complicated owing to the uh, tetrasomic segregation of alleles. So for that, so what we can, what we propose is that like we can practice something called analytical breeding, which is in fact uh, originally proposed for potato breeding by the plant breeder Chase. So what is analytical breeding? So you take a tetra, for example, you take a tetraploid accession and then cross it to the haploid inducer and reduce the ploidy to a diploid level. So now you breed the plant at diploid level and then select the desired uh, progeny and then uh, increase the ploidy back to tetraploid and you can release it to cultivation. So what we have done is that in Arabidopsis, we have demonstrated that we took a tetraploid accession and cross it to a diploid and made the synthetic diploid. And this synthetic diploid, we cross it to a tetraploid uh, again uh, to the tetraploid parent and we generated a triploid. And the, again, the synthetic diploid we crossed to the haploid inducing diploid and we generated haploid. So basically to begin with, we started with a tetraploid and then by just by manipulating the ploidy by using the haploid inducer, what we have generated, we have generated a series of ploids um, uh, ranging from triploid, diploid, and haploid. And this constitutes a ploidy series to study the effect of genome dosage. And also it can be used for uh, multiple other uh, uh, aneuploidy related studies. Um, so using this, so what we have shown is that, so uh, like Arabidopsis has uh, more than thousand uh, natural accessions. And in one of the natural tetraploid accessions, we found um, an interesting phenotype. So what is the phenotype? In general, the Arabidopsis silic is uh, bilocular, which contains two rows of uh, ovules. In this accession, we found a uh, uh, multilocular silics, uh, basically uh, predominantly this had tetralocular uh, silics and thereby as you can see in the cross section there are four rows of ovules. So as a result of which you can double the seed set from compared to the regular wild type what you have seen. So naturally we were interested in understanding what is the gene that is causing this phenotype. But uh, since it is a tetraploid accession, it becomes difficult uh, to do genetics. So for that purpose, what we did is that we crossed, we exploited this uh, haploid inducer that we generated by uniparental genome elimination. And then, uh, so we generated a synthetic diploid and then using the synthetic diploid, we created a mapping population and to cut the long stories short. So what we have found out is that we have found uh, that uh, this is called, this phenotype is caused due to a natural um, epimutation in a floral cadastral gene called Superman. So Superman is an interesting gene in the sense that um, this was discovered in 1994 by Steve Jacobson, that um, uh, this is the first epi epi uh, uh, gene that is discovered by Steve Jacobson that is uh, controlled by epigenetics. So all the known epigenetic mutations are induced. So what we have narrowed down um, by using the haploid genetic is that we have identified the natural epi alleles in the Arabidopsis germplasm and this we published uh, last uh, couple of years ago in communications biology. And uh, so how we can use this uh, haploid inducer. So basically you can use this haploid inducer to synthetic, uh, um, to engineer apomixes and thereby we can um, uh, generate synthetic clonal reproduction to seeds. So apomixes, as you know, that it has a important, uh, um, uh, it's an important dream goal for plant breeders because you can fix the hybrid vigor uh, and, uh, by seed propagation. So apomixes, um, like, uh, so this is the scheme which uh, we are proposing. So basically we have to generate a clonal diploid gamete and cross it to a haploid inducer. And then we convert the clonal diploid gamete uh, into a clonal diploid progeny by triggering uh, uniparental genome elimination. And uh, uh, as a proof of principle, this we have demonstrated this in uh, Arabidopsis. And in addition, using the um, haploids that we have generated, it is possible to practice something called as reverse breeding. So what is reverse breeding? 
so in case of forward breeding you take two um, parents and you gen take uh, you generate an f1 heterozygote so that is forward breeding whereas in reverse breeding you start with the f1 heterozygote and then you can generate the parents so that is reverse breeding and then one of the important components of reverse breeding is to generate haploids and uh, using the haploids that we generated in arabidopsis we again so in principle we uh, in collaboration with uh, um, a dutch group we have shown that okay in fact we can uh, uh, practice reverse breeding um, uh, in Arabidopsis. So for want of time, I'm not going into the details of reverse breeding, but uh, it's already in uh, published literature. And if anyone is interested, you can go through what is reverse breeding and what is its importance. And uh, if you are more interested in how to understand and exploit uniparental genome elimination, we have recently published a review last year in Journal of Experimental Botany and also we have generated a haploid genetics toolbox for Arabidopsis thaliana, uh, like uh, what, what and all we can achieve uh, by using haploid genetics, which is impossible by conventional diploid genetics. Uh, so, uh, so with this, I will stop my uh, talk. And uh, so I was asked to give uh, some tips for researchers who wanted to join Indian Academia. So, uh, so these are some of the tips which I have listed it here. So the first and foremost is that you have to choose a right place uh, that uh, has record infrastructure to uh, address your research uh, questions. And if the uh, the place doesn't uh, have the required infrastructure, I, uh, you should negotiate confidently. Otherwise, it's once if you join and then uh, if, if you want to establish a research infrastructure, it becomes really difficult. And then second important thing based on my personal experience, you should do your homework in the sense that you have to list on what are the equipments you need for you to start your lab and also the list of reagents because in Indian, uh, especially in Indian government uh, organizations, uh, there are a lot of paperwork involved in moving um, the file forward. So unless in other ways you have this list uh, uh, at the time of joining, then it becomes really difficult. And again, most importantly, you have to set realistic um, and achievable objectives and focus on research questions uh, and uh, in a manner that uh, it will fetch quick as well as good quality publications because the assessment is mostly uh, done based upon the research output. Uh, so no matter whatever uh, you contribute to other administrative or teaching responsibilities, ultimately what matters is the research output. And for which I think um, in my personal opinion, you should uh, have some uh, um, very quick fetching projects and also high risk projects also you can parallel continue, but again, um, you have to try to balance it. And uh, what I uh, found um, when I started my lab, uh, when I realized is that uh, one must spend uh, like uh, enough time in the lab bench for initial, initial years along with your PhD students because you have to train the first batch of PhD students. Um, then uh, they will help in the further uh, training of later, uh, like uh, of the juniors. And then again, um, very important thing which I realized is that please don't avoid research for teaching and other administrative responsibilities. So uh, for want of time, if any, uh, uh, like uh, there are many other things, but uh, I will, uh, so I thought that these are the important things based on my personal experience. Um, uh, so uh, which I wanted to convey and uh, with this, I will stop and then uh, like we can take any questions maybe later. Thank you. Thank you, Ravi. It was, it was a great talk and good to know about some tips uh, uh, about how to perform in academia. So with that, I would uh, move it over to Ananda um, for, to introduce our next speaker, Jyoti. Thanks, Thea. It is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Jyoti Lakshmi Vadasari. She is currently a staff scientist at National Institute for Plant Genome Research. After her PhD at Friedrich Schiller University, Germany, she completed her postdocs at Cornell University and Max Planck Institute for Chemical Ecology. She has gone on to win several awards, especially the EMBO Global Investigator Award. She currently works on understanding the molecular mechanisms by which plants defend themselves against a wide array of insect herbivores, and she uses this knowledge for insect control strategies. 
In today's talk, she will talk about her academic journey, India, Germany, USA, and back to India, contribution to science, and tips for young scientists who wish to join Indian academia. Over to you, Dr. Jyoti. Thank you very much for the introduction and for inviting me for this very interesting session. It's great to see you know, that we have such a platform for plant biology. Yeah, I hope you can see my slides. <clears throat> yeah. Yes. So I'll, uh, so I'll start. So I've uh, outlined my talk in such a way that uh, half of it is on my research and the other half about my journey and, you know, how, how I landed up a job in India. So we'll start a little, uh, you know, little bit. So my lab works on plant insect interactions, as you can see in this picture here. And we work on plant, uh, you know, trying to understand how plants defend against generalist insect. So I work at the NIPGR as already introduced. I'll briefly take you through where I studied. I did my master's in agriculture from the Indian Agriculture Research Institute in Delhi. Uh, I went uh, after that, I did my PhD at the um, Frederick Schiller University under the International Max Planck Research School. Uh, uh, and then I went on to do a, for my first postdoc at Cornell. I was a very short one and I returned back to Germany again and did my postdoc at the Max Planck Institute for Chemical Ecology in Jena uh, for the next four years. So in 2014, I joined as a faculty at the National Institute of Plant Genome Research, which is an institute of the Department of Biotechnology. Uh, so essentially, India, Germany, US, back to India. <laughs> so that has been uh, how I have moved. We'll uh, first look at the science part before I come to how the journey has been. Uh, so I work with this very interesting insect called Spodoptera, which is a very generalist insect, which uh, you might you know, find in your garden as well. It eats on various plants, a very wide host range. Uh, so here on Arabidopsis, tomato and maize. Uh, so on maize, they are major pests. Uh, if you know in US also, you fall armyworm is a, a Spodoptera species. So uh, we will look at the interaction of these insects with wide array of plants. However, my major, I work more on fundamental or basic questions. And so Arabidopsis is the major model in my lab. Uh, however, we have recently also started working with crop plants, especially maize. So the, mm, there are three major questions that we address in the lab. We are trying to look at uh, the role of calcium channels in the interaction between uh, Spodoptera and Arabidopsis. Uh, how, uh, you know, what happens if you manipulate these calcium channels to the plant immunity? Uh, the second uh, important topic that we are looking is, uh, what are those insect derived factors or elicitors which uh, regulate this interaction? How, or how is the insect side contributing to this plant immune response? And the third part is we do a lot on secondary metabolites. As you know, plant insect interaction is mediated by secondary metabolites. And we try to understand uh, how they are regulated by early signaling and what are, or, you know, what are their identities? How are they detoxified by insects? So different questions uh, uh, in secondary metabolites as well. Since we are, I have started my lab, we, we have been focusing on majorly on, on all these three topics and uh, we've also published uh, on these topics as well. So why am I interested in this early, you know, early interaction? Ever since I started my PhD, my, the major, you know, what fascinates me to be a scientist is I have been fascinated by calcium signaling, uh, how the signaling pathway is activated so rapidly upon diverse stresses. Yes, or uh, abiotic stress as well. Now, what is the genetic basis of all this? How is the signaling pathway helping plants? So this has been, you know, uh, my reason for starting a lab for, you know, taking up various projects. This was the initial thing. So if we come back to herbivory, the first few 30 minutes of this interaction involves electrical signals. So you can see an insect trapped on the plant here. And we know that there are very rapid uh, electrical signal that travel from the wounded to the you know unwounded part and which activate jasmonic acid pathway and which uh, downstream activate secondary metabolites. However, electrical signals are activated very rapidly in, in seconds. 
This is followed by calcium elevation, which occurs in a, also in a very quick succession after the electrical signals, and which in turn leads to activation of this very important hormone pathway called jasmonic acid pathway, uh, which is key to regulating most of the signaling upon herbivory. So over the years, many people have studied it, but the early part of interaction is relatively less studied in Arabidopsis or any other crop system. So we are trying to understand how, how is this herbivore perceived very rapidly. You know, as I've told you before, the insects uh, are, as they wound the plant, they not only wound, they also release these oral secretions, which have many elicitors or what we call as ham or mam, uh, that are released on the wounding site and they must be perceived by receptors on the plasma membrane, which activates a signaling cascade, which involves calcium, MAP kinases, and uh, transcription factors. So uh, this, this initial part of the receptor, so there is no, uh, we do not know of receptors which are involved in this early interaction between Arabidopsis and Spodoptera. And also um, very little is known about the early signaling part, which we are interested in. So this was the niche area that I started with when I began the lab. Um, as you know that calcium uh, elevations are produced due to opening of ion channels on the plasma membrane and we wanted, we knew that there are calcium elevation occurring when insect is feeding on plants, but we didn't know which ion channels are responsible for that, uh, you know, uh, for that elevation. So when I began my lab at NIPGR, we started with a very simple experiment where we uh, looked at uh, very early signaling genes which are activated when you uh, treat a plant, a spodoptera with, a sp uh, with Arabidopsis with the spodoptera oral secretion for 30 minutes. And we uh, stumbled upon these very cool ion channels called cyclic nucleotide gated channels. Uh, there are 20 members in Arabidopsis, they are, they are ion channels which bring in calcium from apoplast to the cytosol and which is responsible for producing that signature that you see with, uh, with the herbivory. And uh, since it, uh, out of the 20, we found that there are a few which were very herbivory specific and activated very rapidly. And we decided, we started uh, functionally characterizing all of ones which were important here. And we started with the same GC19, which was one of the most highly expressed genes in this microarray. Uh, as you know, Arabidopsis, there are a lot of tools uh, to study functional you know, aspects. And we figured out that if you do not have this channel, uh, you can see in the wild type, these are uh, Spodoptera essays where we let the insect feed on the plants for eight days. And you can see in the wild type how much it is eaten. And if you don't have this ion channel, somehow the insect is eating the plant more. So telling me that loss of function of this uh, gene is very critical for you know immunity against this insect. This is what we quantify here as well, how much uh, insects have eaten or the larval weight. So once we had an idea that this ion channel is critical for herbivory and it has a functional role, we asked ourselves, it is an ion channel. So what happens if you don't have this ion channel in for the calcium influx into the plant? It essentially brings in calcium. So if this is in a wild type plant. Uh, instead of using you know, real insect here, we have used wounding uh, just for the technical challenge of using in the microscope the real insect. So what we did is we cut the midrib and you can see in the wild type, you can see the spread of calcium signal. These are transgenic plants expressing calcium reporters. You can see that the plant is able to sense wounding very rapidly. In one minute, you can see the whole leaf is illuminated and you can see a spread of signals. If you do not have this channel, in, on the other hand, you can see that the spread of signal is reduced and there is, uh, you know, it has lost its way through the vasculature. It leads to aberrant uh, spread of calcium signal and a reduced one as well. So if you quantify it in wild type, you can see the signal. Whereas if you do not have this ion channel, the, the spread of signal is hampered. So this essentially tells me that this gene is, uh, is somehow, you know, responsible for um, uh, you know, producing this calcium signatures that are important in herbivory. 
Now, since we uh, wanted to know further what, uh, you know, we know that calcium based immunity is hampered due to the loss of function of this gene. But why is, you know, but why is the insect feeding more on these plants? What happens to the secondary metabolite pathway downstream? In Arabidopsis, one of the marker secondary metabolites that we use for herbivory is glucosinolate. So we know that increased glucosinolate is harmful to the uh, aliphatic glucosinolate is harmful for spodoptera and they they you know they are not able to detoxify it well so uh, the increased uh, this is used as a marker for immunity so over the time, I don't want to explain the whole story. This is published in 2019. And uh, what we figured out that this ion channel, the CNGC19, is, uh, is, uh, is activated when there are hand, uh, when hands or dams in, are perceived by unknown receptors. Since this is a channel, this occurs in close proximity to the pattern recognition receptors, which uh, many of which are unknown in the system. However, CNGC19 is is critical for this uh, activation of calcium signature. And if you do not have this gene, this elevation is hampered and it also it, uh, hampers the downstream uh, glucosinolate pathway. So if you do not have CNGC19, somehow the plant is also not able to produce aliphatic glucosinolate. So hence the insect is you know, feeding more on this plant. We also found that this pathway is critical for activation of jasmonic acid signaling as well. So essentially, we are we have found a new role for this ion channel in in calcium based immunity in this system. This is brief of what we have done so far. Apart uh, apart from our work on herbivory in Arabidopsis, uh, we have recently moved also into a very interesting system in maize. We are working a lot on the fall army worm, which is Prodoptera frugiperda, and on how uh, uh, it is a devastating pest in maize. And in India, there are very few resistant lines available. So in collaboration with the ICR, we are uh, now in a project where we have identified few resistant lines, and our lab is trying to look at the metabolic basis of uh, you know host plant resistance in these two resistant lines this is something that we uh, we are which is ongoing in the lab so apart from uh, plant uh, insect interaction a few members in my lab also work on this very interesting uh, fungi called piriformospora indica i did my phd on this fungi and i've uh, i am in awe uh, with uh, with this fungi so it's a very special one it's an endophyte which promotes plant growth you can see an arabidopsis plant which is no, uh, uninoculated the bigger one is inoculated with this fungi so this fungi is uh, only colonizing in the root. It has no host specificity. It can promote growth of every plant tested so far. Uh, it does it via in, in, in enhanced nutrient uptake and through transcriptional and hormonal regulation of various pathways. So, uh, um, uh, and we are looking in Arabidopsis and tomato and various, uh, you know, model organism, how this uh, endophytic and good fungi is able to gain entry into the roots and promote uh, plant growth. It's just a recent study where we did, we looked into May 2, how P. indica is able to promote growth and we used a metabolomic approach uh, to identify the pathway of growth promotion. So we figured out that it alters the host metabolism if you start with A and it increases uh, the levels of a specific metabolite called putrezine, uh, which is uh, made by an ADC mediated or adenosine uh, mediated pathway. Uh, so if you have increased putrezine in tomato, it increases the uh, growth of not only it, it, it enhances the production of plant hormones IA and GA. This metabolite is also very good for fungal growth. So, uh, you know, uh, the plant and the fungus both are benefited by upregulation of putrezine. So we, uh, we are trying to look uh, at this pathway more and we are also trying to look if this pathway is involved in the tritrophic interaction of P. indica um, uh, at the plant and the insect herbivore as well. This is our latest story. So which is published and you can look up. So this is the science part of what we are essentially doing with insect herbivory and plant microbe interactions, various questions on this. 
I would uh, briefly go through uh, my you know, journey as a faculty from being a student in India and coming back. I think it was driven by a very good PhD. So my interest in uh, science was because I went to a very good lab uh, and uh, I had an excellent supervisor who gave me both as for PhD and postdoctoral fellowship, a lot of focus on independence that you, you are, you know, you're basically going from India suddenly to Germany. The difference was very stark because you, you, you have to choose your own projects. The supervisor told you can walk around the lab and find out what excites you. So suddenly when you go, uh, that was a cultural change for me, but uh, essentially I've learned to appreciate that uh, focus on independence. There was high quality of science, of course, uh, in either and also absolute lack of hierarchy. I absolutely loved a new culture and language and a new way of life. Uh, I, I loved my PhD and I think that also, you know, that led me to do more and uh, as also a woman in science, so I put up my son's photo here as well that this is with marriage with a child that we we have to move forward uh, for me job hunting in India was especially tough because I did my PhD postdoc everything abroad I didn't have any contacts in India so I, I was aware of this and so I started much in advance uh, at least three to four years before I started I start, uh, you know, I started to apply very vigorously to different places uh, wherever I could. And uh, the key thing was you have to make yourself visible in the Indian academia if you are not educated or if you do not, if you're not done your PhD in India and people don't know you, it's you have to be visible. So I started attending meetings and the notable among them is the India Bioscience meeting. So I attended the one I think in Pune when it was held and it was a wonderful meeting because we get to know across disciplines people coming and it gave me that visibility where you know the directors of institutes were present and they invited me for talks they told me to apply so this was a way of making oneself visible so you can also attend any plant science meetings which are being held in India take that initiative to come for all of this because you will be hired only if you're seen um, that this is the major thing I um, also as I told three to four years before I moved I started visiting multiple institutions uh, giving talks even if you mail the director and do not get a reply, mail to your peers who are already there and just tell, I want to give a talk. Uh, so I started doing that and uh, started putting in formal applications. Now, what I realized when I went for various meetings is that uh, people always tend to be cynical that, oh, you don't have a supervisor, big guy in India who supports you. So you are not going to get a job which is not true at all. I think if you are capable, if you have a good CV, there is nothing that can stop you from getting a good job. But academia, as you all know, it's just one of the career options. Uh, there are multiple career options in India that you can always return to. So my first PhD student, Deepika Mittal, she's just finished last year. She moved on now to, she didn't want to be in academia and she moved on and joined as an editor in Jovi, this journal. So uh, students are also looking at other options uh, other than uh, just being a faculty. So multiple options in India that are open uh, for people who, you know, dare to look at them. So as I told, I work in NIPGR. It's an uh, institute funded by Department of Biotechnology. And the advantage is that we have a decent startup uh, grant and poor funds, which come without you know, ind uh, independent grants, so which we get every year. So this helps survive. There is excellent faculty accommodation, and it's on a very centrally located in Delhi. So I didn't do so much research before applying in NIPGR. It was part of the big, uh, you know, setup of institutes that I applied. And I remember I writing an email to Professor Akhilesh Tyagi, who was the director of the institute at that time, telling that I'm uh, really interested. He didn't write back to me, but, uh, you know, he, I was called for the interview. So even if they don't write back, it doesn't mean that they are not interested in your application. Always follow up. This uh, NIPGR is an exclusively research-based institute. That is, we have very less teaching. Uh, we have mostly PhD students and very good postdocs. So in Delhi, at least we get excellent postdocs. Uh, 
And one of the excellent things of, about this institute is that we have good central instrumentation facilities. So it is easy to start as a young PI. You don't have to set up everything. We have sequencing, proteomics, transgenic facilities like you see in any other institutes abroad. And it is uh, proximity to major institutes in Delhi, IIT, Delhi, JNU, ICGB also helps you in many ways. So when I joined in 2014, I was the first one going to work on insects. So for me, the challenge was establishing this insect rearing and there was absolutely no metabolomics facility when, when I joined here. So this, uh, you know, having that was very critical for my research. And uh, what helped me really is, uh, is this uh, funding that I got from, from the Max Planck Society. So if you have worked there for at least a year in any Max Planck institutes uh, in Germany, you have this Max Planck India partner group. These are flexible money to the tune of one, one and a half crores that you can use for your research. And you, it, as I told you, flexible money is very difficult to get in India. You can, you can hire staff, uh, have consumable money, whatever you want. This helped me setting up this initial lab, having good people uh, in the initial period of, uh, of, of the lab. Uh, this also uh, allowed me to bring in people from there, from MPI in Vienna, uh, you know, uh, starting to talk about setting up many things for plant insect interaction studies in, in uh, uh, you know, in India. This is a picture from, a, you know, kickoff workshop that we organized in NIPGR too. So what I want to tell you by showing is that to have that link with your, with your postdoctoral lab or PhD lab, which is going to help you uh, set up stuff in India. <clears throat> so uh, as I navigate uh, for, a, for, you know, as a PI, so there were many grants that helped me earlier, uh, other than the Max Planck grant, the DBT BioCare grant, which is for women scientists in India, the CERB early career grants. There are grants so, uh, to get when you start your career. Ramalingo Swami Fellowship is one thing which everybody can apply as well. So after this was in the early period, so once you start publishing papers uh, and uh, people know that you 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 can do then your life gets much easier so now we have multiple grants as you can see dbt multi-institutional dambo global and also i'll also come to establishing this facility so essentially select a strong focus area for your research what you want to do uh, here which is based on what your expertise as well so find good students and means to retain them because essentially you you are not the one who are who is going to work so it's the students. So, you know, you have to find a good bunch and retain them and uh, be aware of the challenges never compared to your postdoctoral lab uh, because they are never going to be the same. This, this is a separate, uh, you know, uh, thing that you are having to start. And uh, your major aim should be to have good papers, scientific ex uh, excellence, and a good working atmosphere in the lab. Uh, because, you know, this is uh, 2022. It's not like the older generation. You, the students have to be kind of your friend as well and learn to cooperate and collaborate with peers, at least when you get a faculty position. So currently we have um, uh, uh, six PhD students to have graduated. We have, as I told you, I have excellent postdoc in my lab. I'm very proud of them. And uh, we have also a lot of extramural grants, collaborators. I've just listed, this is my group and all the former members in the group who have, you know, really helped to, uh, to take it where it was. I just uh, uh, take this as kind of my last slide. As I told you, metabolomics is something that we never had in our institute when I joined it. And thankfully, but there is a funding programs from India, like the DBT in Sahaj program, where you can set up huge facilities in India. We set up this, uh, this was funded by DBT, an 11 crore project, where we uh, had multiple mass spectrometers. We standardized various methods for plant metabolomics, uh, which, which was, uh, you know, which was established in 2009 when Dr. Ramesh Swanti was our director. Uh, so there are opportunities if you don't have things you, you and you, people know that you can perform, there is ample opportunities to, for you to build up systems in Indian institutions uh, like you do it abroad as well. My final slide to you as young students, as you know, students looking for a job. Um, I mostly find that uh, the way we apply 
the way uh, the job hunters look for job is you know in this way internet resume you look email but the way employers prefer to fill a vacancy is to have the lowest risk that is higher from within uh, hire people whom they know so when i say people whom they know it's better that you make yourself visible if you are really serious of a faculty position in india make yourself visible talk to people network you can uh, email anybody and uh, you know make knock doors go to conferences that that is what is going to at least in academia fetch you jobs in india with this i want to end my talk our, our institutes we are funded by various sources you can find me on twitter our institute page as well thank you very much Thank you, Dr. Jyoti. So, um, if we can start our question answer because Dr. Rao will be unable to join us due to a personal emergency. Um, if anyone in the audience wants to type their question or raise their hand and ask a question to our speakers, please go ahead. We did get a couple in the chat box, which have been answered by Anik and Ravi. So thank you for that. Thea, you want to go ahead? Yes, I can start, Anana. Um, so this question is for Anik. I have two questions for you, Anik. Um, right, so yeah. um, first one is related to the seed modifications, because uh, you mentioned that the changes that you like the company does is at the seed level. So my question is, if there, like we know seed has storage reserves that is used, especially the lipids, which are broken down before uh, for the germinating seedling until they can photosynthesize their own. So my question will be like, if, if you are doing seed modification, have you seen any effect on those storage reserves that could affect the next generation, uh, like the germination and the survivability of the next generation? Yeah, okay. Thanks, Thea, for your question. Now, just if I understood it right, are you referring to that thing where we say we chip off a portion of the seed to test it before we uh, germinate that's, it? Yeah, that's the, the technique. I was about okay, to yeah. come to that later, but like the, okay. the biology, I was more addressing to the biology when you were doing seed modification for Okay. Uh, or oh, whether we are developing seeds, particularly with higher lipids and things. Like higher, that. So, yeah. yeah. So it, as I mentioned many a times, we develop our products depending, depending on the geography or the region where we want to have them sold or for the, or for the farmers whose solutions we're trying to solve. So if it is a need for like quality traits where we want higher lipids or longer storage, <laughs> or depending on the crop, depending on what needs are, then yes, we would, but not all the times. So we may be developing a crop with higher lipids or higher protein or something for the plant protein, I mean, the protein market in the US maybe, but that may not be in India because people have other sources for proteins like dal and things like that. Way. So depending on the needs, these techniques could be used in other parts of the world. I hope I answered your question. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And and that, that uh, like, I'm curious to know, what's the situation of soybean work uh, in India in general, because I work with so I, I work with soybean okay. right now. So I was just curious because as you just mentioned in India, we have alternative protein sources mm -hmm. like dal, uh, mm -hmm. chola, chana and all those things. So, but soybean is very rich. It's about 40%, at least 40% uh, protein uh, okay. in the seed. So what's the current status of soybean in India? Okay, so uh, maybe I'll pass on that question to somebody else. But what I could answer from my point is as a company, we, I think the proteins, as you said, sources of protein may be more, but there are more varieties and not hybrids. Because of which maybe developing, uh, what to say, a better varieties of soy is really not a focus area of at least our company. Okay, okay. okay. Yeah, and just one last question is about sure. the short corn, uh, because I was fortunate enough to listen to a talk by Kelly Gillespie uh, here yes, yeah. uh, in in, in Bear, Okay, mm -hmm. yeah, uh, in uh, in the Bear. So she mentioned something about the short corn. So what's mm -hmm. the collaboration 
between the US and uh, India bear when it comes to short corn work, short corn work, like which part is? Okay, uh, so the, pr the product that currently is being developed is for, may, could be the US, I mean, primarily the US or any other market if it could be sold in. So okay. since it is pr being developed there, if it could be extended, like quite a few maize hybrids that are being developed in the US are also, could make their way in Indian markets also. Okay. So if it could be used here, it would be used. So it's not done specifically for India, but primarily for the US market. But there is full awareness that yes, there is a need also for short, not only corn, any other short crops in India. So they're also looking at a market in India once that is launched there. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I will move, yeah. I'll give it to Anana. Anana, if you want to go ahead and ask some questions that we already got before, and then I will wait for one question later. Okay. So, uh, Ravi, uh, this question is for you. So how successful has uniparental gene deletion been in crops? Okay, that's a nice question. So, so far, uh, uh, like the published literature says, it's successful in maize, uh, wheat, which is a polyploid, and then... Um, some uh, report has there was there in Brassica, um, but uh, this uh, that paper was retracted. But I think the result is fine, but because of some other uh, this thing, so uh, and also private companies, I think they have reported a very uh, uh, like uh, low frequency of haploids in uh, melon, um, uh, then uh, brinjal and tomato, I believe. So, but uh, it's not yet published. So, because since it's uh, the private companies are uh, dealing it, so unless or which they publish, we don't know uh, whether it is uh, a success in uh, in that uh, in the, in the domain in which they are working. So, and here we are trying to um, uh, translate this in uh, potato and then sugarcane and potato. We have some preliminary results. Uh, but again, we have to confirm it. Uh, so this is in collaboration with ICR Institute, that is Central Potato Research Institute. And then we just started uh, um, a project uh, with Shokim Breeding Institute um, uh, in Coimbatore uh, for uh, generating haploid inducer in Shokim. But the, it's a very complex crop because it's a decoploid. So uh, we don't know how successful it is going to be because we have to knock out all the 10 copies of SINH3 in order to make a in H3 haploid inducer. So again, um, since uh, the, the discovery is uh, like it's 10 years, so the research is in different stages in different crops. Uh, so I think uh, the fruitful results have so far come out in maize and uh, wheat, wheat. Thank you. Yeah. Um, okay, so the next question is for Jyoti. So um, what would be the effect of uh, rising temperature and carbon dioxide on insect population and plant biotic like stress response, do you think? So increased um, uh, temperature is anyhow in other interactions as well. It is not known to reduce plant immunity. So uh, also enhance the insect growth, at least with Podoptera, many of them, if you increase the temperature. And that's one of the reasons I think why also for is also spreading for army worm, which was mainly in the US. It has also migrated to other places due to this climate change. So however, tritrophic interaction in this system, we are just starting to study because even the single interaction is pretty complex with these insects because they detox, uh, you know, a lot of things are not, not known in that plant in, uh, in one system itself. So I don't know of many labs working on, uh, you know, adding a layer of uh, temperature into that immune response. Uh, so this is something that can be done, but uh, yeah, this uh, it 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 in plant microbe interaction, it is known that in it it uh, it enhances uh, or it reduces the immunity. So I see a question in the chat from Kamal Thiagi. Would you like to ask the question yourself? Yeah, how insect meta? Uh, so the Kamal has asked how insects metabolize. Metabolize the toxin produced by plant leaves such as tomato during uh, feeding. 
<clears throat> yeah, so uh, many times, uh, uh, at least in tomato, not much is known, but in maize, it is known. Uh, for example, in the case of a metabolite called benzocinoid, which is a major metabolite in maize against herbivory, it is known that uh, insects add a sugar, you know, some way that you, uh, they, they, they can make it inactive in plants. So they uh, add a, a sugar moiety, they hydroxylate it, do various chemical modification by various enzymes in its gut to detoxify the insect so that it is no longer toxic to it. So in maize, it's known in glucosinolate also, uh, there are uh, reports in specialist insects and generalist very less because generalist is a generalist because it can feed on various you know crops. But in specialists like Glutella, it is known that they can detoxify by desulfonating the glucosinolate. So different mechanism by which they will disturb the base structure of that uh, secondary metabolite. They add different chemical moieties to it via various enzymes uh, through during the evolution. Yeah. Here, do you have any question? Yes, I have a question for uh, for Jyoti related to all the state of the art instrument that uh, uh, you showed that you you have been using for your research. So how um, how efficient it is to collaborate? Say, for example, another research center if they don't have access to any particular mass spec system, whether it's the liquid chromatography MS or GCMS, is it possible for them to send sample and get it done at your institute and how long the entire process takes? Yeah, so this is uh, when DPT established such platforms, it is meant to be open to all. So it's a pay and use facility, even we pay for it because otherwise there's no way you can maintain the quality in India. Yeah, because people will just send if it is free. So we, we, we may, it's pretty highly priced, especially for hormones and all. It's very high, but everybody can use it. We have a lot of samples from all over India. Uh, the, the time frame depends on the traffic on each equipment. Uh, for example, our Q-trap is heavily used for hormone quantification. So anytime within one month, uh, you since you're sending the sample, we we are able to send the data. We not only send this, you know, it's not just sending leaf. You should also know how to extract these things because hormones, if you simply grind in methanol and load it, you're not going to get anything. So we give protocols also for uh, GC, for derivatization, mm -hmm. plant hormones, how to, you know, this also we teach the students or we ourselves do it, uh, but it's open for all in India. Yeah, and so if other labs from other institute they send, can they use your protocol or they can extract the, so their for, way and then send it to you? So for, uh, you know, uh, for established protocols, for example, hormones, they mm -hmm. have to use our protocol okay. because uh, okay. it's very difficult to detect them. I see. Uh, but imagine you have flavonoids or, uh, you know, yeah. other things which are a little more yeah. abundant, they can come up with their own protocols as well. But yeah. uh, essentially what we have learned is for all those methods that are running well, we give our protocol and- Yeah, uh, that's give, the, I think that's the best way. Otherwise yeah, things yeah, can yeah, clog in the system yeah, and it can yeah, yeah, damage. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, thank you for yeah, that. Quite, quite a few yeah. staff on each equipment. Uh, yes, yes. So I, for my research, I heavily use this instrument, QTRAP, GCFID, mm -hmm. MS yeah, system. Yeah, so yeah, I, yeah, yeah, I was like, mm -hmm. this is fantastic to see that people yeah. can do that in India as well. That's really good. Yeah, thank you for that. Thank you. I, I see, uh, I will put it over to Anana. Anana, I see hands raised. I see a hand raised uh, from Kamal, but I want to take Sunil's questions first because we just answered Kamal's questions. So Sunil has asked, and I think anyone can chime in, academic jobs in US start during the fall. Is there a specific time for academic job openings in India? What are the ways you keep track of, you kept track of job openings in India while you were abroad? Maybe Ravi or Jyoti, whoever wishes. Uh, I uh, So, okay, so there is no time period. So each institutes, they advertise uh, whenever there is a, re a recruitment drive. For example, in our institute, like uh, previously we used to have a rotating um, ad uh, rolling advertisement. So anytime, anyone can chip in anytime. And then uh, every six months they used to call. So now I think it's more or less a bit saturated. So there are special calls made every now and then when the positions are sanction, uh, sanctioned. So there is no specific time. So at least uh, with respect to ISIS and I, I can uh, talk about, but uh, other institutes, I think uh, uh, maybe Jyoti like uh, can chip in. 
Yeah, so there is, I just uh, agree with Ravi, there is no specific time, uh, but uh, uh, now most of the institutions in India, at least the big ones, are saturated. That's a fact. So now they're advertising special calls, they're having women calls, they're having in various categories, and FEGR has also yes. advertised, I know, and it, we are reaching that limit of how much faculty we can have uh, pretty soon. Um, but uh, what I find when people look for a job, they just look into these big institutions, uh, which have in, anyhow a big traffic of people coming in. So you have to look at those small institutions which are coming up. For example, there can be an IIT somewhere which is coming up new or an ICER. Uh, you know, yes. look for those institutions where you have a possibility to find a job than just going for NCBS or ICER Pune where anyhow everybody goes. <laughs> So, you know, um, keep on, there are no, you know, for them, it's like an open call. You just have to write to the director or write to some young PI and ask for the process. Um, yeah. At least I know, I think one of the ISA, ISA Berhampur has just started. I think yes. they will be recruiting because yes. the, uh, the number of faculty is less and they are moving to the permanent campus. So I think you can watch for in their website uh, for re recruitments. So, yeah. And to add to that, Sairai also has its recruitment drive in December. So if you want more details, we have several universities and industries who are participating this time. So Sunil or whoever, if you're interested, please check out on our website to register. Next, uh, I would like to take a question for Anik from Shanu. So thank you for your answer earlier on lobbying for regulatory relaxation. Recently in March, regulations on SDN 1 and 2 were relaxed. Was Bayer anticipating such relaxations? Yeah, thanks, Anu, for that question. And yes, we were anticipating. And uh, like I mentioned earlier, along with other companies, there's this organization called the ABLE. So that's how we kind of approach the government. So through ABLE, like companies like Syngenta, BASF, uh, other big players who also have interest in this, we uh, put forth our, even academic institutes, we put forth our, our suggestions to the RCGM for whom who take a call on making these these policies in India. And yes, for some time, I think for from February to for about two and a half months, they had it open for public to put in their comments to get uh, comments from public to aid towards taking this call on deregulating these uh, SDN1 and SDN2 kind of developed generic crops. And uh, we, along with other companies, did encourage people to go and pitch in their comments. And happy to say that, yes. And also, for your information, I'm not sure if you're familiar, but quite a few Asian countries have also opened up with their policies around gene editing. Uh, very recently, it was China, Philippines, and here in India. So showing that uh, we soon may be also ready for products through gene editing in the agriculture sector seeing the benefits that are coming out of that technology. Thanks, Anik. So Kamal, please go ahead. Uh, okay, thank you so much for... Actually, I'm a postdoc in Cornell University. And I just, like, I have a very specific personal question. I want to go back to India and like, I am applying to many like uh, university institute, but like, for the Malinga's reentry policy, but like nobody's responding. So, like, what to do in this kind of situation? And like, I have relatively good CV, not like I have good CV also, but it's still like nobody does. I had this many years ago, <laughs> even in 2014, 13, 11, I thought I just have to apply and people are going to invite me. That wasn't the case. Uh, how you can, uh, the directors might not reply, but you can be proactive and you can write to, you know, people in these universities that I want to come and give a talk. You know, you can, without a formal application, also go around and give talk on your postdoctoral work to be visible. This okay. You can write in any institute. Nobody will say no to you if you want to give a talk. So that is one way that um, you can, uh, then if they are interested, they can tell you to formally apply as well. Uh, so don't give up just because the directors haven't replied. <laughs> Write to younger peers uh, who will reply to you and arrange for a talk. Use your visits to India to give talks. Thank you. Since like 
Five yes. years, I have not visited mm. like much India, so no, I don't know. You have to do. Yeah. <laughs> you have to and, do. And Kamal, I mean, now even with the online thing, you can even do meetings through Zoom and all that, so you can right, right. share your thing. Another thing, also, I want to just add into what Jyoti was saying. How active are you on LinkedIn? LinkedIn I'm like, is a. Uh, yeah, I am there, but like not very active. But I usually hmm. see the post, like if some post is there, like. Uh, so I usually see them, but I'm not very active. Yeah. So this is becoming another tool that both industry and academic institutes use to kind of evaluate people. You all may not know it, but they kind of go into see how, because a lot of things with science is especially for academia, they want science to go beyond the lab. What else can you do with science? So how are you sharing your knowledge with others? So all that is kind of done on social platforms, especially like LinkedIn. So another thing maybe to... <laughs> Yeah, be a little so proactive much. and I will think you. Mm-hmm. Thank you so much. So we don't have a lot of time. We are already running out of time. So Shano, if you would like to ask your question, and maybe uh, our speakers can answer some of the ones in chat, if you don't mind. Go sure. ahead, Shano. Uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, and yeah, uh, my question is to Doctor would be like you mentioned you were going to work with a few collaborators on UGs and on like uh, sugarcane and. Uh, Etc. Um, I was just curious: as is anyone working on uh, wheat? Because, or if anyone might be interested in, you know, generating G's and wheat uh, to, you know, make GM no. wheat. No wheat. I think already the paper is published. Uh, I think by Syngenta, I believe. So uh, there is no point in repeated, repeated, uh, repeating the same thing. Uh, but uh, like, like if you look for publications, then I don't think it is going to fetch any new thing, but okay. But again, it's a lengthy process because you have to generate, you have to uh, like uh, screen the lines and then you have to cross it. But any commercial, like any um, institutes are interested, then we can collaborate. So that's how the uh, potato and uh, sugarcane breeding uh, in, uh, institutes, they approach. And then we had a collaboration and then we wrote a joint grant and then we got it. So uh, and the uh, where I am currently in the ISA, so it's mostly about uh, basic and uh, research and teaching. So we don't have the facilities to uh, uh, like you know grow plants. So in that case, uh, you know to work on plants that require a huge amount of land and resources, it's uh, difficult. So I have to be I have to depend upon the other institutes collaborators for uh, you know uh, translating this technology in any crop of interest. Thank you. Yeah, I'm just uh, because the thing is like most of these companies, you know, they they publish the paper, they, they, they may not release the lines, you know, like you yeah, that is true. From... Yeah, but in that case, like uh, some many beet breeding institute, if they want, then we can uh, help them. But uh, I really don't want to be, uh, jump into beet uh, and then you know start from the scratch, uh, because as uh, an academic researcher, I don't know how what. Uh, like uh, because the productivity is determined by the papers and other brands so it's really difficult unless otherwise there is a collaborative initiative then I really don't I want to keep it uh, uh, like uh, restricted to only few crops or so. Fair enough thank you.